Well, hello, Endow ladies. Simone here, Director of Program Growth, and I'm joined again uh, with Mike Aquilina. And this time, uh, we're going to be talking about St. Joseph. So before we talked about the feminine genius in the early church, that was a really popular episode, and that made me really happy. Um, now we're going to talk about, about the masculine St. Joseph, yeah. guardian of the Redeemer. Um, so Mike, welcome back. Well, thanks for having me back. So good to have you back. And okay, I have to ask you, did you know there was going to be a year of St. Joseph? <laughs> I was joking to people that of course I knew. All I had to do was make a, make a deposit to a numbered bank account at the Vatican Bank, you know? Um, <laughs> but um, but I, th that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where do you get your information? How do I get into that? <laughs> so. funny, what's funny is that our Holy Father made the announcement on the day that my book arrived in the, the warehouse. You see, you see the Holy Spirit, how good he yes. is. Yes. Some people just walk in the light, Mike, and that's you. <laughs> so it was also perfectly crafted, but you are Italian. So I thought, well, maybe there's <laughs> some sort of, <laughs> like, could I be your conciliary? Anyway, <laughs> so that was just awesome. And how exciting uh, for that to be announced on that, on the day he announced it and also, um, yeah for the year of St. Joseph. So I feel like I haven't quite gotten into the year of St. Joseph as much as I could have by now. Um, I mean, I, I read parts of, of um, Pope Francis's letter. I'm like working my way through it and praying St. Joseph Litany, but I, I feel like I've yet to really embrace this special year. So maybe talking to you today can help me. And if there are any other women out there who are feeling like, yeah, I want to, I don't want to waste this like special time of grace and getting to know St. Joseph, but I don't quite know how to fit it into my busy schedule or like how to, how to personalize it, if you will. I did do the consecration from Father Calloway last year, which was great, but now I feel like there's a new opportunity with your book and with this year of St. Joseph to delve in a little more deeply. So first I need to know what inspired you besides the Holy Spirit <laughs> to write a book about St. Joseph. So do the inner workings of your reflections. <laughs> it just grew out of my, um, out of my devotion to St. Joseph. It's something, it's something I grew up with. My mother was intensely devoted to St. Joseph. Wow. Um, it, you know, there, I'm, I'm Sicilian. Yeah. Background, and there's a certain naming convention. There's a certain sequence you follow as you have children in naming, naming the kids. And my brother, my older brother, um, was supposed to be named Joseph. Ah. No, no, no. My brother. I'm sorry. My older brother was supposed to be named Salvatore. Okay. Oh. After after my grandfather, um, my mother delivered very prematurely, which in 1954 was not a good thing. I, I mean, it's um, he had very little chance of survival. So oh, no. Oh. My mother went to Saint Joseph and prayed to Saint Joseph, and when when my brother survived, as he did, and he's still thriving. Um, uh, my, my, um, my mother named him Joseph, okay? violating the convention. Sorry, so, Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> well, nine years later, I was born, you know, and, and, um, and, and I was supposed to be named Salvatore, and she named me Michael Joseph instead. She oh. named me my father and St. Joseph, both. Oh, wow. So your so father's I, name is Michael Joseph, too. Yes, it is. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the second. Um, uh, but we... we this was just part of our life at home. Um, my um, my mother kept an image of Saint Joseph in the house all through through my childhood. That image is still in that house, um, wow. and uh, and I always when I look back at photos from that period, we must have you know got the best light for photographs right in front of that image because I always say Saint Joseph is always photobombing <laughs> all yeah. through my childhood. You know? <laughs> Which is so unlike him as a hidden saint. Still, <laughs> he's making up for it now, I guess. At least, yes, he exactly. He's like, my time has finally come. <laughs> um, that is amazing. I mean, because the, yeah, that's that's amazing. You're, I, I, I don't, I don't think I really even started to hear about a devotion to Saint Joseph until I started live. I lived in Virginia for a while, and and a priest did a whole like go to Joseph homily. I think that's the first time I really started paying attention that that was a thing really yeah. Yeah, yeah. um do you feel like that like your mom's experience is more common is mine more common i 
it's hard for me to say. You have to understand, I grew up in a Sicilian ghetto, right? <laughs> and our parish was, was for the people from our villages. And, um, and it was staffed by the Oblates of St. Joseph. Okay. So everything in my childhood had a certain St. Joseph focus to it. Got the it. The were there. The images were there. Um, we were always hearing homilies about St. Joseph. The priests wow. were intensely devoted to St. Joseph. Wow. And, and, and it was kind of a ghetto experience. We all lived together in this little neighborhood. That was the church I went to. And, and so between my mother and the, the Oblates of St. Joseph, uh, uh, I, I got this upbringing. Yeah. I don't know how typical that was. I suspect it wasn't all that typical in the United States of America uh, during the baby boom. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. But so wait, backtrack. Did anyone get named Salvatore? No. Well, actually, <laughs> I now have a son-in-law. Uh, okay, who, who's who's named Salvatore? And and they, and my daughter and and he have named their son Salvatore. So okay, well, coming up. <laughs> poor grandpa, because I'm thinking of my friend, he's not Sicilian, he's from Naples, named uh -huh. Salvatore, and it was the naming thing is like a big thing, so I thought, oh no, hopefully I didn't get that little Sicilian temper there. You're very calm for a Southern Italian, <laughs> so I don't know if your family says that. Mike, I'm you're Southern Italian, I'm Sicilian. Big oh, difference. I'm so We're sorry. Going, okay? I know better than that, actually, I can't believe I made that mistake but anyway so so saint joseph has already been big in your life so yeah. what what would you say growing up in that ghetto experience was was your relationship with him like was it just so natural that not it, it just was part and parcel even to think about it was strange or is there more something more distinct to hold on to i don't think i ever thought about it i i, yeah. I don't you know it was just always there there and to me it just seemed a natural thing that that the Catholic faith had St. Joseph there at the center with the Blessed Virgin Mary. When it came time for me to be confirmed in fifth grade, I took the name Joseph. He oh, was why wouldn't you? Why, could, why wouldn't you? Of course you why, did. Why, why complicate things. And I took my brother Joe as my sponsor. So, oh my gosh. It was just what you were living and breathing. That's right. So that's for, those, for those of us that didn't have that experience, how do we, how do we cultivate that, do you think? Mm -hmm. Especially this year. So for, for, the, for, the, for the newer listeners that don't know it's the year of St. Joseph, it's the 150th anniversary of um, St. Joseph being declared a patron of the Catholic Church by Pius IX. And so Pope Francis wanted to, to celebrate that anniversary and also, you know, this whole COVID thing that we were experiencing and social unrest and all of the uncertainties. Always good to have a father figure to look up to, and even beyond that, before even COVID was a thing, and social distancing, and all the kind of weird stuff that we <laughs> have been experiencing last year, and also this year. Um, you know, fatherlessness is a real thing. It's a real problem. It's one of the worst things that you know the rotten fruits of the sexual revolution of the disintegration of the family. One in four, at least I can speak for American statistics, one in four families don't have a fatherly presence. That rate is much higher in African American families. So this is a huge problem. A lot of anger and anxiety out there um, and trauma because of not having a father figure. And not having a father figure means that your relationship with Father God is also compromised. I mean, the, the layers and the relationships and the connections between all these things is very profound and very real. So I think we definitely need St. Joseph. Yeah. Um, so how can, we, how can we cultivate that? Well, St. Joseph doesn't make it too easy for us because he doesn't say anything on the record, right? So we don't have words of counsel coming from him. We've got to look to his deeds. And it's interesting what the Gospels tell us. Uh, you know, we, we, we find out a little bit about him in, um, in St. Matthew's Gospel. Actually, St. Matthew is trying to reveal a lot about him, but it's so compressed that it's hard for us to unpack. And, and we don't find out about St. Joseph in the ordinary ways because we don't hear his words. You know, he's yeah. not speaking on the record. St. Matthew records no words of St. Joseph, and St. Matthew records no words you know, by a hu another human being, you know, being spoken to St. Joseph. It's right. as if, you know, the man went through life without conversations. Now, we know that's not true. He was in the Middle East. He never could get a word in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> man. Now, I couldn't say that, but you can. I know I can say it. <laughs> 
for St. Joseph. I've seen a lot of his kind in my circles. <laughs> so what I tried to do with my book is I tried to unpack the story that we find, especially in St. Matthew, but there are hints in the other Gospels as well, St. Luke and, and throughout, actually. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what, they, what, they, uh, what they don't tell us about St. Joseph, what's between the lines. And the way I do that is by, um, is by giving the social and cultural and religious context for his life. So we can understand his actions because his deeds, his actions are all we have to go on. Right. If St. Joseph is a worker, you know, and we do see right. him work. We know he's, he's that craftsman. You know, tradition tells us he's a carpenter. Well, what was it like to work as a carpenter in that place, in that time? What tools did they use? How I did they get to work in the morning? All I love things. that. I love that. So the book title, and we'll link it, of course, is called St. Joseph and His World. And I, I absolutely love that you backtrack from his deeds and then to filling in the gaps with all of the... And I haven't finished reading it, so transparency. But... I, I was so I was so moved by that. Yeah, well, that, you know, this was it, what, what's interesting to me. You know, how did he work? You know, how long were his work days? You know, what what um uh what were his work weeks like? What are what were the days he had off if he had any? Right? Why did he have those days off? Um, then you know, what was his religious training? What was his religious formation in terms of liturgy yeah. and that sort of thing? And how did that religious faith? Um, Form him, prepare him for the events as they transpired in Matthew chapter one, Matthew chapter two, and St. Luke chapter one and chapter two. Um, there's so much that we can learn if we know the social, cultural, and religious context of St. Joseph's life. There's so much between the lines there in the stories in the gospel. Yep, I, I just love that. I, I also thought it was so interesting. I didn't know that, of course, we know about Mariology as the branch of theology that focuses on Mary. I, I didn't know there were Josephologists, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. We have a great one here in the United States. His name is Father Joseph Corpening, uh, and he's, um, he's a, a Salesian priest in uh, Philadelphia, and he does wonderful work. And a couple of the things he's done really speak to the concern you brought up earlier. Okay, he shows in his in, in in several of his books that um that devotion to Saint Joseph really came to flourish only with the discovery of the New World, mm. and it came to flourish in the New World mm. first in Spanish America, and then in French Canada, right? Wow! And in Spanish America, it really uh, came to flourish because of this epidemic of fatherlessness that there were so many unwed mothers there. Uh, because of the the misbehavior of the uh, of the conquistadors, but also because of the um, of of the uh, diseases that were being introduced there, so many families were left fatherless and orphaned, and the the good missionaries that who came from the old country taught these fatherless children to look to Saint Joseph and find a father there. Wow! Finally, this became a foundation for the culture, and then later on in French Canada we find a similar thing happening and it really comes to uh, comes to a wonderful uh, kind of culmination uh, with the, um, with, with the, the construction of the, the oratory of St. Joseph. I wish that I, I went there when I was a, a, like a young teenager. I wish that I could have had the maturity at that time to pay more attention to the significance. I just didn't know that history, but I remember being really struck and it being really incredibly beautiful and, like revisiting Andre Bisset and all of that in this past year has been so enriching. And I, I kind of want to take a year of St. Joseph pilgrimage and go back there and, and revisit that. But that is very interesting information. So how perfect is it now to have St. Joseph? Like, Especially for Americans, you know, yes. North Americans, South Americans. St. Joseph is our guy, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and we're the ones who really uh, brought devotion to St. Joseph to the fore. I mean, there had been, there had been forerunners of, of, of this devotion down through the centuries, but it, it's in America that it really came to flourish. Yeah, exactly. And I have a, this huge, I mean, of course, with the Tao and the feminine genius and spiritual motherhood being the height of, height of the feminine genius and so forth. But along with that comes the masculine genius and spiritual fatherhood and the, and the real need for that. And I mean, it, it is heartbreaking seeing so much of the anger and the anxiety out there and the social unrest and the violence and knowing that while everybody is keeping the conversation on a very 
either like wrong categories and superficial categories or political categories. Like the real wound is what has been stolen from these entire generations of fatherlessness. And gosh, we really, really need, so how do we, how do we backtrack? How do we re, re, renew culture? I mean, how do we get spiritual fathers out there for this father? How do we, how do we rely more deeply on St. Joseph and, um, and, and God the Father through him, because there is this real big wound and that needs to be healed. Uh, well, I think it's by following his example, okay? We don't have the words, again, we have the deeds. Right. How do you follow his example? Well, we know him to be a worker, right? We know him to be so someone who was identified with his work, but he worked for the right ends. You know, I'm sure St. Yeah. Joseph was not workaholic because yeah. he loved his wife. That is, that is so clear. Wow. The New Testament narratives. Wow. He loved his wife. He loved his son. We know that from the New Testament narratives. So, so he teaches us to work for the right ends, mm -hmm. to work for the sake of the family, to work for the sake of God. So I have a chapter in my book on St. Joseph and his work. And I talk about not only the tools he used, you know, not only the jobs he worked on, not only kind of the, the technical aspects of a construction job in first century BC, but also, you know, uh, his attitude toward work as it was formed in his religious environment. Because the Jews were unique in the ancient world in wow. placing a high value, very high value, on manual labor. Wow. Okay? This was really disrespected by the other ancient peoples. The, uh, the, Jews, the right. Romans, the Egyptians, they looked down on manual labor. Right, right. The, you know the, the 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 great thinkers who invented democracy didn't think that manual labor should have any part in democracy yeah. that, that was the work that was for slaves mm -hmm. only the jews only the people of israel had this value of work and all their national heroes were laborers right if you go through the patriarchs of the old testament they were men who worked with their hands before they became uh right or, right or kings or whatever right. They were working with their flocks. They were they were doing things. Right? That's so interesting. And, and is that why that became a value within Judaism or the for the nation of Israel? Is that why? Either way, uh, you know, I don't know. What we know is that there's this, this it was between between the thought of ancient Israel and and really the way this was lived out. Um, in the time of Saint Joseph, in his lifetime. Uh, Really, this was the apex of that value because the king who reigned during much of St. Joseph's life was Herod the Great. And why was he named the Great? One of the main reasons was that he was a great builder. Mm. He had these building programs that were vast. Um, and for that, he needed craftsmen. He needed carpenters. He needed laborers. He needed men who worked with their hands. And he valued it so much, he paid them so highly that they became known all through the Mediterranean region, and uh, and 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 the the peoples in the, the 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 countries all around there used to recruit laborers wow. from the Holy Land because they wanted these people working on their construction projects. Wow! So really, this was a great time for a laborer like Joseph to be alive. There was a lot of opportunity, wages were high, and you were valued for what you did. Okay, and it seems to, to me that Joseph had that work life balance. Uh, you know, yes, I <laughs> can't get away with it otherwise with, <laughs> with Our Lady and Our Lord. <laughs> like, there was really no other way. <laughs> so. He did his work, but he knew why he was doing it. Yeah, wow, that is so huge. And I love the topic related to labor, I love the topic of leisure. And I love Joseph Pieper's book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture. And just having that proper understanding of what work is for yeah. and, and, you know, work that for, for an end and also the work of the Christian, which is prayer and, and contemplative work. Um, you know, I agree with Pieper, as I'm sure you do, that leisure is the basis of culture because without that kind of space, you know, workaholism is really is the really the enemy of leisure because without that space for God, for family, for the other, you know, then we've been relegated to 
uh, undignified levels of existence. I mean, we always have our dignity as humans, but when we don't rest and pause and celebrate and, and worship, we, we have, we have reduced our, our, our nature. To yes. Of slave. And St. Joseph had that built into his life, of course, as yeah. a devout Jew. Okay. Because yeah. All labor, as we learn from the, the, the book of Genesis, God models labor for us. Yes. He has six days of work for the sake of the seventh day. Yes. Okay, all that work is, is ordered to leisure for the sake of worship. Mm -hmm. So Joseph, all through those years of working hard during a, the world's greatest building boom, would have, um, would have been laboring on six days for the sake of the seventh. Yeah. So that he would enjoy the Sabbath with his family. And in the synagogue, he had that family time and the um, and the uh, the time for worship as a devout Jew that was built into his his program of life. Really, I love that, and I love when I lived in Los Angeles seeing the Orthodox Jews like like walking to to synagogue on Friday nights, and because they really took it so seriously, you know, and and no electricity and no and that's an extreme form right of the Sabbath, but. On the other hand, in such a consumeristic, workaholistic, wor worshiping work culture, it was so nice as a young adult at that time to see people really take their Sabbath seriously. Yeah. And, um, and I believe that's why St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother chose Egypt as their destination when they had to flee Herod. Okay? Yeah. It's quite likely. Uh, all the evidence seems to indicate that their, their own ancestors, their own families had come quite recently from Babylon. Right? Uh -huh. They were there from the time of the exile until they returned to the Holy Land in order to found these villages, right? Mm -hmm. Nazareth was founded about 100 BC. Amazing. And it's created out of the wilderness. There was nothing there. And suddenly there's this, okay. this village that's peopled by the, the clan of King David, the descendants of King David. And Joseph and Mary were among those descendants. This is a great thing. It just gives me chills. This just gives me chills. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can see it's like, it's like, like, like God is, is moving everything. Yes. Moving all it's the all so dynamic. For hundreds of years. And that's what I, that's, that's why I had so much fun doing this book. Because you get to revisit that time and go into the little details yeah. to see how God was preparing his people, you know, for that moment when, when. Yes. When, when he would reveal himself in, in, in human form. Oh, um, incredible. So why, why Egypt? Why not Babylon? Well, in Egypt, there was, there was a really rich Jewish culture. Uh, Jews made up about 4% of the population in Egypt at that time. And that's comparable to their percentage of the American population right now. So if, if they went to Egypt, they could be sure to find neighborhoods villages, entire villages, suburbs, where they might raise their child in, in, um, in, a, in a place and among a people who, who were congenial to the faith, yeah. okay? who, who could live the life and model the life for him. They were thinking. Yes, they're, thinking. they're ghettos, they're ghettos. They had their Jewish ghettos there that they could yes. be part of, incorporate into the community. Two of the, two of the major neighborhoods in Alexandria at that time were, were Jewish ghettos were these neighborhoods where the Jews could live together and live by the law. Mm -hmm. So Joseph and Mary knew what they were doing when they chose that destination, even though it was a longer journey and a more perilous journey. Mm -hmm. They took that road, and uh, and 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 they they went to the place where they could they could raise a child as a good Jew, and he could live that life that was labor ordered to leisure and worship. Oh, so incredible! I just love that Jesus' childhood was in Egypt. You know, it's just <laughs> so special. Yeah, it is. It's just so neat. Um, and I've been to that area in Cairo where the Holy Family stayed. And yeah, I mean, it's so, it's so rich because everybody there knows what it's about. Everybody, yes. every, everybody there knows what it's about. Because when you're, when, you're, when you're persecuted, you hang on to all of the everything that, me that is meaningful for your faith and for your culture and for your life. So, okay. So you conceived of this idea to do this book on St. Joseph. And one of the things I appreciate is in the beginning, you talk about the sources and what sort. So where did you start in research? Because at Endow, one of the things we pride ourselves on is that we're actually reading sources. Like we're reading the, the actual writing of the saint or 
papal documents, magisterial documents, like that we want, we want that our, our community likes to, you know, read the actual primary sources. So where did you go in, in your sources for this? Because there's so much, so much that's not available, at least explicitly because of Joseph not really speaking in the gospels. <laughs> where, where, where did you go? where did you start? Because you said you well, had fun with this. So yes, um, <laughs> where did the fun begin? <laughs> I mean, the, the, first I tried to get a sense of that period from, from the, the sources uh, that we have from that period, the Jewish sources that we have from that period, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, from the works of Josephus, from the works of Philo, from the intertestamental literature. Wow. I tried to get as, as, as much as I could from the documents that were produced by faithful Jews in that time. Uh, and I tried to to read the history. I read all the biographies of King Herod. In that, oh, that is so cool. That's so cool. Yes, yes. I found him to be such a fascinating figure because he was a genius in so many ways. I mean, he was a genius at diplomacy. Here is a man who negotiated successfully with Caesar Augustus, Cassius, Mark Antony, Cleopatra. He was a player on the international scale. Wow. And he was also, and also a great builder. He rebuilt the Jerusalem temple till everyone, you know, everyone knew right. that it was greater than it had been in, in the time of King Solomon. Right. He, he outdid Solomon in its vastness and in its beauty. Uh, he was a genius and he was a sick ticket. You know, the guy was just messed up. He was a <laughs> I was going to say, I, that is, <laughs> the way you describe him is so un foreign to the way that I've been thinking about Herod, who, you know, you see this like childish, narcissistic, violent, money, you know, power hungry, you know, murderer. And, but, you know, here, here he is. I didn't even know there were biographies about King Herod, like oh, to that extent. A lot of good ones. And, and, uh, and you, you know, um, uh, he, he, he was called Herod the Great, even while he was still alive. Yeah. And he wanted to impress his greatness upon the people he ruled, but also on his neighbors. Yes. You know, keep them respectful of his right. face, right? Right. So two ways he did that. One was by these magnificent buildings mm -hmm. to strike awe in the people who saw these buildings, to make them gasp when yes. they saw them. Yes. That's one way. The other way was by massacres, mm -hmm. by making people fear him, by knowing that he would stop at nothing. If, he want, if, he, if you stood in his way, he would kill you and he wouldn't even think about it. Yes. You know, on, on one particularly bad day, he killed 300 of his military leaders. 300. See, that's more of how I was thinking about Herod. <laughs> but you know, there's, an e there's an evil genius there, right? Like, there's... He was famous for her ma his massacres. He killed, um, you know, he, killed, he killed three of his sons. Uh, he killed his mother-in-law. He killed, uh, you know, a, a brother-in-law. He killed um, his favorite wife. He, he had her killed. Um, <laughs> so weird. <laughs> you know, so many of his family members, uh, once he had two rabbis burned alive, and then he had all of their disciples rounded up, and he had them publicly executed to make examples of them. Another time he called the Jerusalem Council to consider the question of whether he might be the Messiah. And you could tell he already had his answer in mind. Right. right? See, that level of narcissism was where I was going. So, you know, but when they voted against him, when they said, no, that's not possible, he had all those people who voted that way rounded up and destroyed. Yeah. And he kept one person alive and blinded him so that he could live forever, at, live, you know, live on as an example. Oh, jeez. Wow. So, wow. I mean, that's that's the, the thing you know scott hahn in his foreword to my book points out that my book is kind of presenting these two men on parallel tracks you know yes. uh, there's the life of herod and there's the life of saint joseph but they're they're almost going in in different directions yes. you know at yeah the, at the same rate of speed um so 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 yeah it's um uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating figure in history. So you asked about sources and you got me going, right? Yeah, I know. That's awesome. <laughs> it's I, you know, my, my, I wanted to get into this period. So those primary sources were the first place I went, the biographies of Herod, but also archaeology from that period. I read a lot of works of archaeologists, archaeologists who have worked in Nazareth, who have worked in Jerusalem, and who have, 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 um, have a lot to say about how things were done in that period, how carpentry wow. was done, how agriculture was done, all of that figures into the story. Wow. I See, I make up that this whole process 
was so meditative and prayerful and contemplative for you because you're like, uh, is, that, is that true? Is it's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Well, to me, to me, it's, it's important to feed the imagination so yeah. that all of these things that were revealed by God through the, the evangelist, Matthew, the evangelist, Luke, they come from God, you know, yeah. and they're, they're, they have infinite depths. In order to sound those depths, we've got to feed the imagination. Yeah. We've got to flesh out the, the, the scenes and, um, and, and see more of the background, see more of the foreground. And this is the way I do it. Yeah. You know, I read, uh, I, I get into the, the, um, uh, the scenes a little bit that way. Um, I've, had, I've had the opportunity to visit a lot of the, the biblical sites, and that's been a great advantage. Yes. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's how I, Incredible. I, I, yeah. I mean, what a, first of all, what a service that you've done for the church in terms of this book where the fruit of all your contemplation and study in this handy dandy book you can order on Amazon or whatever. But, but I, I'm jealous, Mike, because that whole journey that you took reading all this, discovering all this, imagining, praying, thinking, making the connections, like that's such an incredible incredible experience so i have some holy jealousy over here because <laughs> I, I have kind of a holy jealousy for myself because i almost wish i could go back and do it again you're never, you're never quite pleased with the final product and there's so much that you'd, you'd like to get, go deeper into but the yes. public is on the other end waving a contract at you telling you telling <laughs> you, you to get it in on a certain day so yes i i definitely relate to that where you just you just <laughs> never feel satisfied with all the research because you, you the more you research the more you know there is to research and there's you know but still that that's that's pretty maybe there'll be a part two who knows a little you just never you never know um yeah. But I guess, I guess our research will never end if we didn't have that person saying, hey, <laughs> deadline, you have to make a choice. Um, well, this has been great. I guess, I guess before we say goodbye, because I, I, again, of course, one of those conversations where I want to pick your brain about a million other things, but do you talk about in the book or do you, what do you think about the whole debate about was Joseph a young man or an old man? What's your opinion on that? One thing that I that I try to make clear in the book is that is that the church um, the church has not de right. declared one way or another on this question. Right, right. And it's, it's a serious it's a matter of serious dispute, right? Mm -hmm. And he liturgically remembered in certain ways that we should respect because they're part of the liturgy. Okay, mm -hmm. I do have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> what I try to do in the book is give the context within the whole church, East and West, right? And then, and then uh, say that I have an opinion. It's my opinion. I have good reasons for holding this opinion. Yes. I think, I think I do anyway, and I give you what those reasons are, but I don't force you to take my conclusion. Yes. That's the way I, I treat it in the book. I, I, I definitely have an opinion, and probably because it's so Near, near and dear to my prayer it's a strong opinion but i think we we go wrong when we um um when we let our passion our passions take over in these yeah. these matters of legitimate dispute yes exactly and that's why i asked what your opinion was not you know because i know the church doesn't proclaim anything about this and but um i have an opinion and my mother has an opinion so mike you've got to settle this for us <laughs> You have to be on my side, Mike. <laughs> well, I don't know what your side is, but I'll tell you. Yes. I, I think he was a young man. Okay. okay. I, I win. Because my mother loves you, Mike. So, you know, <laughs> I'm going to keep that for one of our passionate conversations, and I'll, I'll pull that card out at the right moment <laughs> in a charitable, kind, and patient way. <laughs> <laughs> But I she's, you know, the Egyptian, the East, you know, they, they have the, they think he's older. So that's right. And that's why I try to be very respectful because yeah. again, they're, they're reading these texts in their liturgy and they have been reading these texts in their liturgy since probably the second century. So I want, I want to be very, yes. very respectful yes. of, um, of people who disagree with me um, on, on, on this, even though I have a strong suspicion they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Can you give me your top three reasons? Uh, well, <laughs> one is is just the the arduous journeys that 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 we find just in the gospel accounts. Okay. Yeah. That um 
that if Joseph was in his 90s, as some sources say he was, um, it would be a hard thing for him to make that little journey, relatively little journey, to, to, from, from Nazareth to Bethlehem on those roads at that time. That would have been, that would have been difficult for him. Mm -hmm. The journey to Egypt would have, would have killed him, I think, mm -hmm. uh, because, um, because it was, uh, it, it was so long. You know, we're talking about a journey of more than a thousand miles on very primitive roads. Okay? Right, right. And you're traveling by night and you're traveling with brigands, you know, watching, watching out for people to rob and, uh, and you're in hiding and you're under a lot of stress. Um, I, I think for St. Joseph to, uh, to do the work he did as we see it in the New Testament, yeah. he had to be a young man. Now, I know that the saints have other reasons, which I also like. Um, for 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 believing that he had to be a young man, and that is, so that he could he could uh, you know enter history as an icon of chastity, uh, mm -hmm. a, a masculine chastity. Um, I have a strong suspicion that this the figure of the older Joseph was introduced in order to counter first the rabbinic attacks upon the Blessed Virgin's um, yeah. divinity. Okay, yeah. that that they tried to cast doubt upon that by 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 showing Joseph to be a harmless old man like me, all right, so, um, <laughs> you know that that's that's that that was an apologetic strategy. Yeah, to understand why the, yeah. the the ones who wrote the the the, the apocryphal accounts of Joseph's right. life, I right. understand why they went in that direction. Right, I, I don't I don't think it was good in the long run because it kind of um, just reinforces the idea that that a man can't be chased. Yes, you know? I was going to say that and they certainly can. So, you yes, know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is something that's possible and St. Joseph shows it to be possible, you know? Yeah. So I like the idea of the vigorous Joseph, the masculine Joseph, the 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 hard working Joseph, the chaste yeah. Joseph. Yes. And a picture of the holy family that just looks a little evened out. <laughs> so, yeah. just anyway. But there's no schism over here in the Rascala home about it, but you know, it'll, it'll be fun to, fun to have that conversation again. Um, so, you know, um, St. Joseph's feast day is coming up later this week. How do you celebrate St. Joseph? How does the Sicilian celebrate St. Joseph? Hmm. You know, I don't have any particular way. In our house, we celebrate everything with the dessert, you know? Yes. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. I've learned that if, if they reminded their parents of dessert or showed a certain astuteness in their understanding of the calendar, that, that their parents would probably make a dessert or buy a dessert that day. So, uh, so we, always, we always recognize things with dessert. Um, other yeah. than that, I, I do try to do um, uh, a novena of the Sundays before St. Joseph's Day, nine Sundays before St. Joseph's Day. Oh, um, so not just nine Sunday. days before the 19th, but nine Sundays before. Yeah. See, so that, so, so that is a nice preparation. What what does one Google to get that novena, or to, is there something special? Where did that come from? I first heard about it from a priest of Opus Dei, so I imagine that it's a, either a Spanish custom or it's just a custom which within Opus Dei. So oh. I imagine that if you Google it, you'll find some texts. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'm gonna I'll, if I find it, I'll I'll link it to this interview. I'll Google Opus Day St. Joseph Sundays and see what happens. So that's great. That's I great. There's like so much get overwhelmed in the Catholic world with all the different ways you can uh, spread this devotion. But if ever there was a time. Well, thank you, Mike. Any last thoughts? And thank you again for writing this book and, and doing this for us. No, I mean my my um my only thought is is uh is um is to to urge people to get back into the texts, to to read the Bible. And, and strive to read it with understanding. You know, this is just one book. There are many books out there that that um that are designed to um to to get you into the scenes and to live the scenes as if you were there as an eyewitness. Because that's what God wants. That's yeah. why why He revealed these things so that it didn't just happen long ago and far away. It happened in your life as yeah. one of your memories. And He's God, so He can make that happen. Oh, I love that. That's very Jewish of us. It's in our memory. It's in our, it's in our spiritual DNA. It's, it's yes. what we're living here and now. I love it. Thank you so much, Mike. And I hope that you're back on the Endow podcast again soon. Well, thank you for having me this time. I'll, I'll come back anytime you call.
<laughs> Thank you.